The scene here is San Francisco Harbor. The ship has just arrived from Baltimore through the Panama Canal, bringing in its cargo the six reels of submarine telephone cable that we see being transferred to a waiting barge. The end of the long journey from the Eastern Factory is near, but the final resting place of these cable circuits is to be the floor of San Francisco Bay. In fact, these are the actual circuits that were planned to serve the artificial island that was made to rise from these historic waters as a home for the Golden Gate International Exposition. And after serving the crowd thronging this appealing panorama of foreign and domestic attractions, these same circuits will be part of a great new cable artery. This artery will join the others already winding beneath the surface of the bay to bring the voice of America to this busy port on our western shore. There's an interesting engineering story in this sequence of pictures, but I see in them another and a special significance, and that is the extraordinary skill and technique that is mobilized in this modern day to combat a small but deadly peril to such circuits as these, a single drop of water. Yes, it is of vital importance to prevent the entry of a single drop, for if one drop can enter, so can another, and another, and another, until the electrical transmission of speech is impossible. So underwater circuits must be provided by the cable makers with unusual protection, both against leakage and against accident. The camera's lens gives us a close look at this protection as it pictures two cable lengths being spliced together. The splicing job itself is no small task. The engineers anticipated the needs of the coming years and called for 1,056 wires, each wire separately insulated. There's a boiling out process with petrolatum to remove every trace of moisture. And then the lead sleeve is pulled over the splice and there's some mighty hot lead to handle as the sleeve is made part of the cable's smooth and pliable metal coat. This looks like a workmanlike job, but these cable men aren't yet satisfied that the splice is airtight. They're going to conduct a most important testing investigation. A hole is made in the lead. Nitrogen gas at 20 pounds pressure per square inch is forced through the hole to surround the wires just spliced. And then an extremely unromantic substance comes into use, plain, everyday soap suds. But the soap suds are most effective here. For if gas is escaping, there will be soap bubbles to mark the spot. The job we're watching is pronounced good. The double armoring is the vitally essential precaution. Nothing on the bottom, like a dragging anchor, for example, can scrape or break the sheathing of the circuits and let the water in. And since the corrosive effect of salt water on metal is a peril to be guarded against, the armor gets two final overcoats of tar-treated jute to make corrosion very, very slow. Finally, about two miles of armored cable is coiled on the big drum, ready for its underwater resting place on the floor of the bay. One of the piers of the Bay Bridge that stretches more than eight miles over land and water to link San Francisco and Oakland is the midway point for uniting two long underwater sections. A diver first goes overboard to make sure that all goes well in placing the pier end of the cable. And when he's back on board with his report, there's nothing more to do except head for the terminal on the distant shore while the cable disappears in the churning waters the barges wake. So look out, Father Neptune, down there in your underwater kingdom. Here come 1056 wires. There's no use trying to get them wet, for I don't think it can be done. Pictured here is a telephone truck parked in the field. That's not unusual in itself, but here's an activity that does seem a bit out of the ordinary. Can it be that we're seeing the sections of an oversized fishing pole being joined together? Yes, that's just what it is, an oversized fishing pole, but not of the kind popularized by that famous old angler Isaac Walton. This particular pole is in reality a radio antenna that will fish telephone messages out of the air and it will also cast them into the air. 
What we are watching is a routine test of a portable transmitting and receiving radio unit that makes it possible to combine radio and wire telephony for communication purposes. An important use of the apparatus might be in such emergencies as when a hurricane or a flood, for example, has brought about a gap in the wire facilities. Since communication at such times is all important, the engineers set out to develop this radio bridge which will span the gap while the wire lines are being restored. The entire equipment weighs only a few hundred pounds and can obtain power for its operation from a gasoline-driven generator in case other power is not available. There is a combined radio transmitter and receiver of special design that needs only simple adjustments to be ready for service. A third unit for switching and general control completes the compact and portable outfit. In a few minutes after reaching a locality where service has been interrupted, the antenna is in place and connections made with the telephone wires at the point of the break. And then station, well, let's call it station P-H-O-N-E, is ready to go on the air, ready to communicate with a similar unit that is waiting for messages across the flooded valley, a storm-swept mountain range, or in some suddenly isolated community, or perhaps at an emergency relief station such as a Red Cross field hospital. The usefulness of portable emergency equipment was abundantly demonstrated in the New England hurricane of 1938. Many towns were completely isolated, but in several instances, telephone engineers with hastily improvised apparatus were able to establish these radio links so that combined radio and wire communication would connect the stricken communities with the world outside. And so again, we find science and engineering in important cooperation to provide a means for getting the message through under unusual emergency conditions. These pictures, therefore, bring us good news indeed. Here are scenes reminding us again that the place to learn about the interests of a people is where they gather in large and revealing numbers. For anyone curious about our national enthusiasms, our pleasures and our relaxations, the obvious and wise procedure is to go where they are spontaneously displayed. To walk with the jostling throngs, to follow the crowd to some stadium, for example, where collegiate gladiators battle amid modern football pageantry, or to a ballpark filled with ardent admirers of our national pastime, or to the scene of exciting water sports like this regatta along Maryland's historic shore where the breeze is blowing keen and fresh and the skippers have met to match their wits and their skill. And someone is following this crowd. It's the telephone company experimenting with a trailer equipped with telephone booths that can be towed far out in the country where people may assemble for a few hours and then disappear. Here it comes with the installer's car close behind so that the trailer can quickly be connected with nearby wires. After that is done, and with Miss Maryland presiding, it's all ready for those who may have need for its convenient presence. As for the great groups of our population to whom agriculture is life's major adventure. There's no better place to become acquainted with them than the fairs which attract thousands from both countryside and town. And since in talkative America, means of communication are essential for such gatherings, some portable telephones in a trailer such as we see here being made ready for an Ohio fair may prove to be just what the visitors require. At any rate, the idea is getting a test in the best of all laboratories, that of actual use. Only a half hour's work is needed to get the wires up. Then, the trailer is an integral part of the country's telephone system, and Miss Ohio can put through calls just as though from a railroad station or hotel. So here is one more modern note in the scene that inevitably changes with the years. But the carnival spirit still surrounds it, that alluring call that generations have heard and welcomed, that intriguing, inviting summons, hi-ho, come to the fair. Let us be glad that these blithe and lively institutions still offer the traditional and fascinating blend of information, entertainment, amusement, adventure. 
who would alter the pleasant panorama that promises to careworn age or carefree youth so much of surprise and novelty and fun? What more congenial place for horse lovers than the grandstand where they can thrill to the sight of beautiful runners as they round the track in the poetry of a thrilling race? Of course, there are serious and enlightening exhibits to show important developments in agriculture. But important developments in merry-go-rounds need investigation too, with sideshows to spice the dish. Aristocrats of barn and barnyard brought many a mile in the quest of a blue ribbon, pass in review before critical judges of pulchritude and pedigree. But everywhere is the constant evidence that the farm's best products are on two legs, not four. Yes, come to the fair, learn about sturdy rural America, Mr. and Mrs., Master and Miss, on the holiday that reveals so perfectly their friendliness, their accomplishments, their hopes. I thank you.